Here we are with GMT's Kasserin, their 2001 title, uh, designed by Vance von Boris, also known as a fairly well-known designer of East Front Games. This one, of course, is about North Africa, but I think he's far more well-known for his work on the East Front series. I have uh, actually dabbled in that and played a little Barbarossa Crimea. Um, but I really enjoy his Roads 2 series, the Roads to Moscow, Roads to Leningrad. I think they're really great games in a sense that they're one mappers for me that's really important I don't have a lot of table space I also think they're just fun scale you're dealing with companies and battalions and so the, the size in my head is much more manageable if I'm imagining the battle which is you know admittedly not a huge uh, thing for me I don't need I don't need a game to really evoke the sense of battle for me it's just fun to play a game I know that's pretty much heresy for a lot of board game uh, aficionados but um, I just enjoy a good fun game, and uh, I found those to be really fun. A little 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 bite sized low low counter density games. I think they're actually a lot of fun. So when I started looking more into Vance von Boris design history, of course, Kasserin uh, kept coming up. It's one of the more highly regarded titles, at least. Um, although with sometimes with games that are older, you do have to wonder if it's more nostalgia factor. Although this is not like an SPI game, obviously, this is only 15 years. Um, so the hobby is old enough to actually have older, much older games, of course. But you do wonder if sometimes if it's just time looking back and, and having fond memories, as we all do, of games that we enjoyed playing. And, and of course, uh, Vance is a, is a fairly good designer in this game. If you read the rules, um, it, you can definitely see how this was a progenitor towards the Rhodes 2 series. Um, it says in the design notes here, it even cribs a little from the East Front series at the time and adds some different things, but um, you can clearly see the beginnings of the Rhodes 2 series, although clearly this is also a, an earlier product. It's not quite there. Um, a few of the rules are different, although it largely plays the same, I would think. Uh, we're going to find out. Actually, I say that, but uh, it's probably going to be totally different. But I should say that the rules, if you know the set, the rule sets to the road series, you probably wouldn't have a ton of difficulty adjusting to this fairly quickly. Uh, I was able to scan through most of the rules, and, and everything pretty much is the same. You're going to have, uh, instead of a chit draw game, we're going to have an I go, you go. So it's always going to have the axis go first, and then the allies will go, and then you do a reset phase. Uh, air power is a little more... Uh, distinctive, which I found is pretty interesting. If we cruise over to the side of the board, kind of poke over. There it is. Right, we're going to cruise over here. Got a new setup in this basement I live in now. You can see there's the air table there. And um, whereas in the Rhodes 2 series, your airplanes are mainly used to give you modifiers in combat for close air support. Here you still have that option, but you also have two other um, choices. You can use them for interdiction to sort of stall uh, movable units of your opponent, or you can also commit them to just doing airstrikes in, in the attempt to get a uh, unit loss or disruption. Uh, so a few more options available for your air power than, than you would see in the road series, although I'm guessing the scale is the, the big reason why the road series lets you only do close air support strikes while this is much a much grander map, if we can just sort of do a little sweep here, I should just sort of show you. I mean, the road series obviously uses bigger hexes, bigger counters. Uh, these are just the half inch counters. I think the road series uses a 5 eighths counter, but you can see here because of that, there's just much more area on this map than shown on the roads map. So I think that kind of makes sense why air power would have um, the ability to do interdiction, for example, or airstrikes. You can see here, we're dealing with, obviously, a little older vintage era GMT stuff. This is the card stock that was brought in for the setup cards. Nice black and white. Um, pretty much still very easy to set up, but of course, some of these units, of course, like, uh, I'll just point out, like that guy, he was, he's in a totally different color. You can't really tell because it's not uh, uh, very difficult to see that here. <laughs> anyway, on black and white with some, I guess, grayscale. Um, but the map itself looks, you know, very much like a modern war game map. It has sort of the graphics. If you played the Road series, you'd be instantly familiar with this. Even the East Front series, you would be instantly into that mode. You would know exactly what you're into. Here's some of the other player aid cards I have here. We got sort of just very basic um, victory point schedules, turn tracks, sort of force markers if your groups get too big and you want to have sort of uh, adjustments. And then there's the weather track up there, which is just pretty basic. We're using, we're doing the first scenario. This is Fayed Pass, so it has its own turn track on the setup card. It's only six turns long. Here we go, get adjusted. And let's see if I can get, there we go. We'll zoom in here. So for Fayed Pass, before I zoom in, just to give you the general uh, makeup of the map. Here, we'll go over here, yeah. 
generally the map is going to be somewhere like the, it, it extends over to here, even though you know, the forties and it goes up to the seventeens. We're doing like a rectangle over here that includes the town of Sibit. What is this? Sibitla. Sibitla. I'm probably doing that wrong. It's S B I T L A. Yeah, going to butcher names in this part of the world. Sorry to say. And um, but of course the main action is going to take place here at Fayed Pass. So let's zoom in a little bit and take a look at what we're having to deal with. So in the six turns that were allotted here, the Germans' main goal are to secure the Fayed Pass here, which is being held right now uh, by the Allies, by British, um, I believe that's, no, those actually might be French troops, actually, yeah, those are French, They're being held by French troops. Um, they also hold this little smaller pass here by a uh, city, or, right, Kralif, little trails to the mountains there, and also here at, uh, what is that, Rebaou, Reba, Rebaou, Anyway, R E B A O U, Reba O. Anyway, passes here, here, and here. Essentially, the goal is to take the Fayed Pass because that's sort of what gives you um, the nominal victory. And of course, you can also do a sort of better extended, you know, smashing victory. I forget the term they use. If you can also extend and take over here at City Bonzid and this mountain here, uh, right by the road, gives you nice strategic cutoff ability. Uh, if you can secure that as well in six turns, and you've just you've really done. Um, You've done them a, a, a service for the Germans, I guess, in North Africa. Uh, other than that, what is different about this game than the Rhodes games? Pretty much the same. You can see the units look the same. We have the same kind of values. We have the red um, box guys who are motorized, and they obviously you can just zoom around. They have the higher values, but also they can, uh, if they get stuck in a zone of control, they can just pretty much power through by paying a little extra and keep moving. Whereas other units like the uh, leg infantry guys here with just the regular black values, um, they get stuck, essentially, and so do these sort of orange circle that count as motorized, but because they're an amalgamation of trucks and various other things, they pay. They don't get the benefits of being fully motorized, but they and but they have to pay all the motorized costs for getting across terrain, which is higher than um, leg infantry movement. We also have some headquarters still that have command points, so you can see a lot of the same things were in the road series. Uh, I have two points to use for anybody here in the 21st uh, Panzer Group. And uh, we have anti-air, some of the very basic things. We have uh, uh, any kind of red values can be used for anti-tank uh, efforts or in, in rolls. So if you have armor involved in a battle and you're at the lose end of that battle and you get what's an armor attrition result and there is someone who has that sort of defense in red, then you have to lose an armor step, things like that. Um, other than that, the other main thing that, that's a big difference, because it's I go, you go, every every unit gets to move at once, then your opponent is given some reaction moves, uh, which is basically the same things that we had in the road series. You have the combat refusal, you have, let's see if I can pull this out here, just because a, a non-moving screen and me talking is kind of boring. Um, we have some of our favorites, right? We have some no retreats, which let you not move or stop. We have... Um, the combat refusals, which is where you just sort of run away. And then we also have the reaction movements in which you, if a battle occurs within two hexes and you have red box movement um, or red whatever movement, then uh, you can move half your MA in any direction. So it's interesting because we're in the Rhodes games, you sort of piecemeal move your forces right and in total. Uh, in this game, it's going to be all out, all out, all out, all out. And because of that, there's an additional um, movement phase. So you get to move everybody, you have your battles in combat, and then your red box units get to move up to half their MA again. And this is where I think it's going to play a lot different than the Rose series because your armor is really going to be very key for doing those breakthroughs, right? The point of that kind of movement cycle where you get to move, have combat, and then move again is really um, meant to emphasize the breaking of holes and then throwing your armor or like very fast units right through to exploit and to cut off supply and just sort of wreck havoc in the rear. So, yeah, that's kind of what's going on there. Unlike my other videos, I don't think I'll be doing turn-by-turn -turn action on this one. That takes a lot of detail, and honestly, I kind of just want to enjoy this one since it's my first time playing Catherine, and I want to get through it. I might video um, some turns or some action, but honestly, I think I'm just going to do updates. So just letting you know off the bat, I'm not going to go through this entire turn, but I will talk about some of the things I need to think about. One of them is reinforcements. Oh, I'm zoomed in. That's what the deal is. Okay. So essentially, the Allies are going to have a lot more troops to throw at the at the battle, but their troops start further away over in uh, 
Blitia or whatever that, that town is right here. So it takes a while to get down the road to the Fayed Pass, but essentially they will have a little bit more troops to throw at it, and you will get that sort of seesaw effect, whereas the uh, German player, the Axis forces, uh, will be able to sort of take the initiative, but then we'll probably have to face the inevitable pushback from superior forces, because the Axis mainly are already on the board, but they do have sort of this group here of the other 21st Panzer. I guess it's a, I need to learn how to read these probably better. It's the, hey, wait, I think I have a handy sheet that tells me how to read units. Let's take a look. I should probably just know this. Yeah, it's just a unit designation, so I need to probably just learn how to read those better. But it is the 5th Panzer and the 21st Panzer group or something, I'm sure. Uh, apologies to historical people that are really into that. I, again, am not, you know, that's not the, the huge reason I get into war games is to memorize order of battles, tables. Um, although I can see the benefit of that, and I think that can be fun and interesting in its own right. It is not something that brings me additional joy when I play a war game. But um, nonetheless, I get it. I get why people like it. So I apologize if that offends your sensibilities. It's like hearing someone who's tone deaf and you have perfect pitch. You can understand. Okay, so the thing is the Germans get these reinforcements at 30 a.m. And you have to pick one spot. You either have to pick um, where they come in on sort of, I guess, we'd say the right side of the map. I need to find the compass rows to know if that's north, south, west, or east. I'm going to guess it's east since I'm guessing the top is where the med is. Anyway, we'll just say the east for now. And I'll probably be wrong, but we'll say the eastern portion of the map. You can choose to come in there, or you can come in on a little part um, just south here. So you can see where that access supply point is here. They can come in here and kind of wreck havoc there, which is, uh, so either you get to come in basically over there or at the bottom there. Okay. Now, the reason that's kind of important is because this is, this is your assault force right here. I mean, it's the cream of the crop that you have in this scenario, at least. It's a fully loaded, whatever size unit this is. <laughs> we have a lot of companies here of tanks. Another reason I like this game is because you can tell it's a lot of companies and battalions. It's something I can really visualize in my head. Lots of great units here. The totals, I believe, up to 20. If we do the quick count here, 8, 11, 14, 18, 20, uh, 21. But these are all red box units, which means they can, if they stack together, they can overrun together. Uh, they can do some other really fun movement things. Uh, whereas this unit cannot overrun and can't, I believe, advance after combat and some other things because it's a heavy, uh, I believe, anti-air unit there. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's the punch. It's the force that punches. So you have two various thoughts here, at least I'm thinking, looking at um, the situation at hand over here. My thoughts are as follows. I can either bring all the forces here except start at that point there and just become overwhelming and hopefully try to knock out the passes right away secure all three and that way any of these reinforcements that come up can't just sort of hold this advantageous ground because if we get a little closer yeah there we go if we get a little closer here let me show you something that's an interesting wrinkle in this game so we have our our friend the strong point is back but then we also have our friend the minefield and it's already, already goofed in this scenario because um, allied minefields are sort of unknown values. You put them in a cup and you draw them out and there's a question mark. And I for, you know, I kind of goofed in the rules when you encounter them for the first time in combat, you flip them over to see what the value is. Um, they can range from 0, 1, or 2. This one became a 1. There's supposed to be one here in uh, Riva U, but I flipped it over and it was a 0. So I probably should have kept it there. That was my bad. As the Germans, it's, it lets you know right away that Riva U or whatever is much more vulnerable. Anyway, minefields just add more DRMs to your combat. I believe it also might have other effects. I need to look up the rules in terms of bypassing them or getting through them. I think they might be a movement hindrance as well. Um, but yeah, just another little wrinkle it can slow people down. It also gives you a nice little advantage and it's nice not to have the plus two there. But um, the Fayed Pass here is definitely in a mountain, as you can see here, maybe you can't quite see it, but there's definitely mountain shading there. And I have to look up the, what the terrain effect is for mountain. Oh, it's not good. Terrain effects on combat are plus two. Can't overrun. And it's a plus two on the coordination die rolls as well. So it's definitely something that's not fun to, to attack into. But that means if you can hold it, obviously it's going to be tough to retake as well. That's the main issue though, right? Do I bring an overwhelming force to try to secure these? Now, even knowing that this thing has a three. What is that? Anti, um, that's anti-armor, right? Anti-tank. So that's three, four, five. 
and it's a minefield and a strong point, so you get plus two DRM, it's a five points. We don't have a lot of power with the forces on the board here, with what the Germans have starting with. We have sort of this anti-air, we have this sort of uh, motorized infantry here, that's a three. Uh, we do have another motorized infantry here, that's a five. But that's pretty much our main units. The rest are artillery, some infantry, uh, some Italian uh, low-powered infantry. So if we bring in our sort of really fun, motorized, powerful battering ram group, yeah, we're going to have enough to take it, but it's much more of a, you know, blast the front door open approach. The other idea, though, is to take this group and instead come in the south and use their superior mobility to come in here, threaten the rear area here, take out maybe a couple units, but mainly cut the supply here so that all these units become out of supply and face sort of the units that will inevitably come out of Sublitia to come in sort of reinforce. Um, that's much more risky because we're splitting our forces. Um, the benefit could be greater though, right? Because if I can get in here and just sort of wreak havoc on any of these rear lines, they won't be able to reinforce the passes at all. And I'll be able to have the potential to cut supply. So it's something to think about in terms of deployment and strategy of what I want to do. And honestly, I thought about it a little bit on camera and I think I'm going to go a little gutsy and riskier and I think we're going to come down here and start here and sort of become that threat because uh, I can, I think I can motor up the road here, overrun this unit pretty easily, start attacking and then use the extra movement I'm allotted during the motorized movement phase to sort of move up here and cut off supply lines. So I'm thinking that's going to be the general strategy here. So we'll just go ahead and throw these guys on the board. They can all stack together. Um, stacking is a nine. It's like in the other games, you can only have nine points in a stack. Um, if you overrun, you have to all the units have to be red box movement. They have to all start together and move together and all that kind of jazz, right? Let's go ahead and put these guys down here. I think that's where they have to go, right? 70-23 or 59-33. Oh, they move one over. Nice. Nice. That helps. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and put them there. And, and uh, I guess the idea will be to sort of launch up this way. These guys, I think, will have enough to maybe take that and that and at least kind of keep them in place. It's risky letting the Fayed pass just sort of be held. Um, but the idea is maybe if I can clean up enough of these guys, then I can just sort of take it very quickly by doing sort of pincer moves by consolidating and eliminating these sort of random uh, defenders here. So, yeah, we're going to do that. I'm going to come back in a little bit. I'll give you the update of what happens at the end of the 30 a.m. turn. All right, here we are back um, at the end of the first half of the 30 a.m. turn. Well, almost the end. We're about to do the final parts. I kind of wanted to show off the uh, access motorized phase here, but uh, we're going to describe the combats that happen, uh, and then we're going to finish it off, and then I'm going to pause again, and I'll come back. So we're going to do this little piecemeal, right? So if you remember, then, uh, from the last video, I decided to split my armored forces down here because they could have come in from the south here. I'm going to say it's the south. I still haven't found the compass rose. I'm still too lazy to know which way is north. Um, so we'll just call this the south. And then some forces could have come in from the east, but I chose the south. So uh, because of that, I was hoping to get some nice cutoffs here and eventually cut supply to this pass so we could get the clock turning on running through emergency supply and weakening those units. Um, so initially I basically had four different attacks planned. I had two attacks down here on the guys that were over here. I had hoped I could have overrun, but it turns out you can't because of the um, presence of mountains here. Or that, that actually was hills, so you can't overrun anything but like clear terrain essentially. So I was hoping to do that, but that didn't really work out. So instead I split my forces and made two different attacks here. Um, went for this one, vaporized the unit, not really a problem. This attack, I had very good odds on it. Actually got the combat coordination check, which I'll talk a little bit more in a second because I had the uh, DRM modifiers thanks to my leader, my HQ unit there. And unfortunately, I just wasn't able to seal the deal and get a low enough roll. And instead, um, this unit here retreated here and ended up blocking, as you can see, this hole that I had created or was hoping to have to exploit uh, got filled pretty quickly when this unit was uh, able to survive its attack. Really unfortunate. was really hoping to clear that out. Just a, a not good roll there for the old Germans. Um, or for the Axis powers, I should say. Because there actually are some Italian allies. So it is the Axis powers. Um, 
Over here, we have these other two attacks with our eastern forces, correct? So this is where I've noticed one big time difference from the road system versus this older Kassarin system. So in the road system, combat coordination is one of the things you do under certain circumstances, not always, um, but under certain circumstances you do it, and what it involves is uh, rolling a, a, a check against an ER rating of a unit. So if I was using that tank as my lead unit, I'd have to roll against its efficiency rating with modifiers. If it was not modified, it'd be a six in this case, and I'd have to roll a six or less, and it would pass, and if I rolled a seven or higher, it would fail, right? Well, if you failed in the roads games, you got essentially... Um, uh, just an additional die roll modifier that made your final combat roll much worse, right? Like you still would have five to one odds, but it would just be you would have less chance of getting the good end of the five to one odds attack, right? Uh, in Kassarin, if you fail your combat coordination check, it's a shift two lefts uh, against you in the column. Or the odds column. So if you come in with four to one and you miss your odds check, then it becomes a two to one attack. Uh, and because we're using assaults and not mobile attacks, you really don't want to be getting too low on the assaults table. It, it's not pretty for the attacker. So because of that, I had to really kind of think about shuffling my forces here. I wanted to make sure I had adequate ability to um, uh, get through both, even though there was only a one defender here and there was a two defender here. So I really wanted to stack the forces, but it, there was just no way to assure that I wouldn't have... I wanted to at least be able to eliminate this guy for sure. So I brought the mechanized uh, infantry up that gave... Uh, this armor, the Italian armor, the ability to get a combined arms bonus, and that lets you get a shift to the right. So it helps you kind of offset that, right? Whereas in the Rhodes games, all these things are die roll modifiers at the end. In Kassarin, um, it's the combined arms bonus and the combat coordination that can really uh, affect the odds calculation, right? This attack went swimmingly as well, able to vaporize that unit. So that pass is open. Not much of a pass, really. It's really just more like a mm, trail through the hills or whatever. Didn't go for the center, right? It's too strong. We're trying to choke it out of uh, existence. So we focused a lot of our other forces here on the southern one, and this was going to be a pretty dicey attack because not only was there a minefield, which if you remember the earlier video, we found out was a zero. You're supposed to leave those untried because it adds to your combat coordination check. Uh, anytime there's a minefield present, you have to add plus one to the combat coordination roll. So even if it was a zero and goes away, you still get that plus one modifier for the very first roll. So they came in... Um, Actually, I don't... Th did they get their combat coordination? I can't remember if they did. No, I don't think they did get their combat coordination. No, they did. They did. They actually did get their combat coordination. It was actually really lucky. They got that roll. I need to flip him back over, actually. And I brought in two airplanes to help me for getting die roll modifiers, right? Because you can have the options of what to do with your air power. The Allies opted for interdiction but failed because their their air force is pretty pretty bad. It's, uh, you can see here the values, it has a 3 ER rating, that's the top right number. Um, so, it, and it's really only good for air striking, it's not even good for any kind of, uh, it can't, see that zero, that, that the numbers in the le the bottom part, the left is the airstrike number, the right is the DRM for close air support. So it doesn't even help with close air support, it's only good for air striking. Um, these units can have, this one's superior for air striking, but a 2 DRM. Nice 7 rating, though, for efficiency, and the same here, you know, another 7 efficiency, 2 strike, 1 uh, DRM rating. So I had both these guys in on this battle, roll an 8. <laughs> so that didn't help me out at all. Unfortunate, because that roll ended up going not so well. I mean, it was a 5 to 1 attack, so not, you know, that's not bad, but not great either. And uh, essentially got a retreat result, so they got to run away as well. And this is also after it had artillery whiff on its support roll. So, I mean, ugh, that, was just, that, was, that was a missed opportunity. It was the most difficult attack, but it was a missed opportunity. So, there we go. That retreated back there, which also plugged even more of this hole. So, they've kind of reestablished our line here. Um, but now we go to our, our final part of the phase where we can take any of our red box units and move them half their MA. Um, so, the, like these seven guys can move three and a half spaces. Trying to think if there's, that's even really worth it. I don't think it is, only because all the regular modifiers apply to moving. So we got something like rough here, that's two. I mean, I could go up here, I guess, and get a little closer. That's always probably helpful. So I guess I'll do that. And yeah, we'll just go ahead and do that. And then I think we can take these guys do kind of want to leave a unit there because I believe 
it gets rid of the strong point. I'm going to double check that before I move these guys, but I'm going to essentially just move them up here to, to keep close watch on that artillery so it can't help out. Essentially, if you put a unit next to an artillery unit, it has to be flipped to its fire side and it can't do anything. So that's the one thing about that. Probably also move these guys up a little bit, but then this is the real one. So we have what? An eight here and a seven. Okay, so we got four and three and a half. Sorry, I'm just being kind of messy with my movement. All right, so that could be, let's see, and one, and two, and three, and yeah, we could go here and cut off their supply, so we still could do that. Hmm, I think I will do that. And the reason we're going to do that is not only does it cut the supply to all these units here, it does kind of put us in the open. We're definitely not in supply ourselves right now, but there are some units coming after us. If we kind of like uh, poke our camera up, you can see some of the American units coming out. There's a 4 4 up there, there's a 5 4 here, a 4 3. So they could get some units, but I don't think they'll be able to get double or two to one odds. So it's going to be kind of a risky attack for them to come up there and just start messing right away with our... It's a fairly strong stack there. So let's see if we can go there. Yeah, see, see, you can kind of see that's, that's the overview of the giant situation. So by doing this, we're going to put a lot of pressure on these guys to react and try to decide how they're going to attack or if they're going to swarm this guy or whatnot. So... I'm going to look up to make sure what I need to get rid of strong points because I don't want to just leave those active. I definitely want those gone. But otherwise, I'm going to kind of get snug up against those guys with the movement. And then we're going to go on to the second half of the 30 a.m. turn and see what the allies are going to be able to do uh, in response. Here we are at the end of the 30 a.m. turn, the first of the six-turn scenario I'm playing here to... See if the Axis forces can capture Fayed Pass, and uh, we'll see. It's kind of off to a little bit of a rocky start. As you saw in the first half, I wasn't really able to get um, a lot of the attacks off down here. There were two sort of botched attacks that let units sort of scamper away, uh, weak units, but uh, nonetheless, they were able to sort of retreat back, and I wasn't able to fully uh, sort of exploit this underhand area I wanted to to cut off supply. Um, that basically meant I had some units that were able to cut the supply unit off here to Fayed Pass, but they were relatively strong, but not, not as strong as they could have been. The result was, on the Allied turn, kind of had an option here. I had a bunch of these sort of units down here tied up that kind of kept these forces in place, but obviously we're not going to be able to withstand another round of devastating attacks from, you know, 9 to 1 or, or more odds. Many of these units here, we got like 9 here, we have another, you know, there's another 9 factors there, and so forth. So the idea was, do you pull back? Do you try to counterattack? What do you do? And I had just enough forces from some of the other um, entries that came in from up here. There was an infantry unit up there. There was some of the Sabletia group. Here's some of the reinforcements coming in next turn, but they weren't there. There was just um, the green units you see there. So it was going to be that armored unit there, and I believe also a, um, what is this? Yeah, armored or infantry with an armored accompaniment. <clears throat> And also this infantry unit. So, you know, I had, what is that, uh, 9, 13 factors there. And bringing in the somewhat weak units that I had available, including this 2-2, two, two, you know, this 2-2, two, two, and then a 1-1, one, one, and then another 1-1, one, one, I was able to get 2-1 to one odds, which was not an amazing attack, but it was going to be mobile because it was on open ground and I had an armored unit. And the real question comes down to is the combat shifts, the failed combat coordination giving you two shifts to the left on the on the um, CRT. It's really a it's a it's a it's a bugger. <laughs> you have to really think about it because many of the American units and the French units, or I'm sorry, British and French units, um, you know, some of them are pretty good quality. But I mean, look at that. It's a four. There's another four. You know, there's a five, a five. There's a six. Right. So that's the best unit I had. And he's fairly valuable, or they are fairly valuable. It's not just one thing. It's, it's, it's a whole group. So, you know, they're fairly valuable right there. Um, but because of the fact that some of the DRMs involved, so when you do sort of the combat, you know, when you're doing the combat coordination role, right, there's DRMs. One of them is, are you using different allied nations to attack? Then, yeah, if you are, boom, you automatically get hit with the penalty on DRM. Luckily, because I only had one attack hex, I got a sort of a mitigating DRM that sort of negated that sort of uh, penalty for having two different nations uh, combine in an attack. 
Um, but regardless, I had a 60% chance of getting the role, which, you know, is, is pretty, is better than half, right? But um, failing it would have made a two to one attack go down to a one to one attack. And so what I had done is I had these units, so you can see here, you can obviously tell that the attack uh, succeeded. But what I did was I was able to take these units, pin the, the German units here, the Axis forces. I took these units down here, brought them here, brought these guys up here, and did that. Brought that attack in because knowing on a mobile attack I would most likely get a retreat result, it gave me an opportunity, hopefully, to force these German or the Axis units, I should say, because it also has an, uh, an Italian unit there. It's not just Germans. Um, by forcing them to conduct a retreat through an enemy zone of control, which I could establish through every conceivable path of retreat, they would have to roll an ER check, and if they failed it, they would take a step loss. Um, because some of the scenario special rules say if I lose um, armor steps, I can fail the scenario or have a lesser victory result. I don't want to risk losing any armor steps. So, of course, my motorized infantry, uh, which did have a 6 rating. I want to do this backwards. You know, it did have a 6 rating, right? But I rolled it, failed it, so it took a step loss, and they retreated down here. So not so great, because that meant the Fayyid Pass now is still open and the uh, units there will not be out of supply, so unfortunately I will not be running that two-turn clock. Uh, they just barely stay in supply, and these units are cutting the, this road off, and this unit is cutting off these hexes, but it can still go through here. It can go one, you know, two, or like one, two, and it's there because this road is now open for supply. So what does that mean? We're gonna move on to the next turn, the 30 p.m. turn. I rolled, it will be clear weather. So once again, the hopefully the superior Axis Air Force can actually do something this turn. That was a big failure to not have their DRMs in this battle down here. Um, but unfortunately for the Axis, even though they do have completely overwhelming force right now on the board, I mean, um, like I said, there's like nine factors here, nine factors here, even though it's got reduced, this is still five factors. This is, what, three, six factors. So, I mean, we still have quite a bit of firepower we can throw at any one stack. We can't really necessarily spread our attacks out and get a lot of power. Um, but it's going to be difficult to attack, to, attack uh, to really counterattack here, although we could kind of swing through here and maybe cut off supply again. I have to think about that. Um, but some of the results of this combat, as you can see, is that we created that pincer, they retreated, they took a step loss, and I had to make a tough decision on how to reposition my forces because I knew a counterattack was coming. Um, the blue forces they attacked on this side were not that strong. There's just two, three, four defense, you know, four factors of defense, I guess. Um, which meant I didn't really want to leave them hanging out here because I knew they'd just probably get vaporized pretty quickly. So I had to make the hard choice of retreating them over here because uh, orange circle units cannot advance after combat. So this poor artillery unit is going to just be left hanging. It probably will become soon for this other world or whatever, I guess, or transferred or ineffective or rendered in whatever they call step losses, right? The logic you use. Um, so what I kind of did is a little shuffle. These guys took their advance after combat, went one, two, stayed there. These guys just came over one because I have three, seven... Uh, 11 defense factors there and because they have an armor unit here it prevents a combined arms bonus for the attacking axis uh, uh, forces uh, so essentially i'm going to have to hold out here and see uh, what i can do about the germans or think about the axis forces if they want to spend more time cutting off or if they want to try to do another frontal attack and just sort of uh, hit these guys or if they just want to try to take the fight pass now because they realize that the out of supply situation might be difficult to capture i don't know but one of the other things they have in America, or the Germans have to think about, and the Italians, is this reinforcing force out of, Sib what is this town? Sibitella? Sib and Sibitella? I don't know, anybody's going to tell me, somebody will tell me in comments, or maybe nobody, and you'll just know I butchered it terribly, but there you go, you can see it, right? But finally we have the armored headquarters coming on. We have some more armor, which is great. We have a recon unit, and this weird strange unit, which has no power, one defense, it's motorized. Um, Turns out it's an anti-tank unit. It's considered an anti-tank, so yay. Yay, worthless anti-tank unit, which can be helpful. I'm sorry, that's not worthless. It does cause armor steps, and that is one of the things we should try to do to the German or Axis forces. <clears throat> sorry, I keep saying that. We also have some artillery and some self-propelled artillery here, which is nice. I have not seen that in uh, any of the Rhodes games before to have artillery that actually has red... Uh, red movement. So that's pretty interesting. That's going to be, although these are all halved, I believe, according to special rules for the scenario. So you know, not as effective, um, but still very interesting to have self-propelled artillery. I was like, oh, that's, I've never seen that one before. So pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, but yeah, those forces are coming on. That's nothing to sneeze at. And if they can somehow combine with the forces here, really the Axis are going to have their hands full in trying to both 
take the victory hexes while not uh, sustaining armor losses, which is a fair amount of their punch in the force here. So yeah, going to be very interesting. Five turns to go. Uh, when we come back, it'll be the start of the Axis turn on the 30 p.m. turn.